Um, is this my microphone? Does it work? Yes, it seems to work, yeah? Okay, buongiorno a tutti. Uh, these were the last words Italian I will use, uh, but still. I have to use this one? All right, all right, good. Um, so buongiorno a tutti. Uh, so, um, what I want to talk about is a little bit, what's the future of technology, really? Um, what can technology give us and how we're going to build this technology? Because the point is, it's actually up to us to define this, this future of technology as we do in, in events like this. And if I read <coughs> the kind of information about these kinds of events that you, that, you, that you get online or you get in these little information folders, I'm always getting a little bit worried. Like what are actually really the objectives? What does it mean to, to advance and use technology? Right? So that's very much the theme. I will use, let's say, creativity and aesthetics as an entry point into that discussion. It's not the only thing I'm going to talk about. Okay. Um, so maybe we can we can can we improve the light here a little bit, or that's difficult. Okay. Okay. Our our eternal fight against the sun is still not resolved. Um, so let's go back to basics. Okay. Let's just focus on stuff that matters. There's already one thing in the technology discuss discussion. Um, often you see a lot of noise about things that really don't matter at all. I think we should always pose this question, okay, what are things that really matter to us as humans? Right? What are the fundamental issues we have to deal with? So the three fundamental questions humanity was facing already when they were sitting in their caves in Lascaux, in which we have these beautiful uh, paintings, and now they found other paintings also in Indonesia recently. So what are the three big questions that humanity is facing? Okay? And in my opinion, whatever we do should pertain to those fundamental questions. The rest is all irrelevant. Okay? So if we don't deal with these fundamental questions, we're wasting our time. So first, of course, the origin of the universe. Right? What's this blinking stuff in the sky? Yeah? We know a lot about it now. What's the origin of life? Right here we have a cell trying to find its way among other cells. Um, and the third question is, what's the origin of consciousness? So these are our three big questions, okay? And in my opinion, whatever we do should pertain to any of those three in some form. If, we, if you cannot find a trajectory to what you do in life, to any of these three fundamental questions, you're wasting your time. You might disagree, but we can discuss that. Um, so with my team at, uh, in, in the the Synthetic Perceptive, Emotive, and Cognitive Systems Laboratory in Barcelona at UPF, Pompeo Fabra University. You see we take um, workplace security very serious. Um, but not only that, we, we, we are dealing with this one big outstanding question, which is very much, okay, what's the origin of consciousness, if you want. But we do that in a way <coughs> that is really about how do we link the physical properties of brains to the mental properties of minds, or the, in, in the classic days, this was called the soul. Yeah? So can the machine have a soul? I think they can. We can talk about that. But for me, this is the fundamental question we have to deal with. And this is very much a question also of technology, if you want. Also, the technology we are all dealing with, we want to give physical matter functional properties that are mind-like. Right? We want to give technology capabilities of perception, decision-making, learning, memory. We want to organize physical matter in a way that it has mental properties. And this is exactly what we study in this field. We, we, uh, and this is actually the only piece of technology we know that has all these properties. And in the meantime, it's also highly energy efficient. It's called the brain. All right? So this is what we try to study. <coughs> Consciousness is just one of many properties of these physical systems. And I'm going to tell you a story. Oh, the proposal I'm going to make to you is for us to make, future, to make progress in the development of our technology, we have to understand this piece of physical matter called the brain. Everything else is a waste of time. Okay? Dead ends. And I will, I will argue my case with you. So let's just look at some examples. Um, this is the kind of stuff we do. So here we have a, an ICAP robot, uh, a, a proud, the proud outcome of Italian engineering at the Italian Institute of Technology, and this robot is interacting with a human being. 
This robot does this, however, in an autonomous fashion. This is really important to, to appreciate. It's not remote controlled by a human engineer, as opposed to Asimo. For if you go to an Asimo demo from Honda, you have about four engineers hiding in the corner with remote controls, and then the thing falls down the stairs, right? So this robot is interacting with this human autonomously. So let's take a look. They're playing this, this musical game on a, a tactile uh, musical instrument called a reactable. No, it's off. Okay, thank you. the connection. Keynote quit. Well, I'm sorry for that, but we'll recover. So anyway, so to, oh, we also lost the connection here. Do you see dolphins? Yes. All right. So we were about here. Can you hold them like that? So the point is for, for a robot like the ICAP to maintain this kind of dyadic interaction over extended periods of time. Um, do we have sound here? Hello? Yeah, for folks. Um, this robot must have quite a number of capabilities, like motivation, it must have a drive to act and interact. It must have a drive to engage in a game or win a game. Um, it has personality. That means in social interactions, we take on certain roles, and these roles can be defined as a personality. 
right? an expression of personality. <coughs> it has emotional states, that's why it's saying these obnoxious things once in a while, it's frustrated, it loses and so on. It must be able to learn, pay attention to the task, perceive, make decision, share attention with the human player, make predictions about what the human player is going to do, so read their mind, have an autobiographical memory and so on. So just to, to illustrate to you that this whole claim about linking psychology and matter together is actually being realized in building this robot. Not necessarily are all these problems fully solved. They're all, if you want, initial steps in this direction. The perceptual systems of this robot are still very primitive compared to our own. The emotion model is a hypothesis on how our emotions work, etc. So you see this model, the robot, is like expressing a theory about how brains give rise to psychology. It's not the same, it's not identical. It's a bunch of hypotheses, right? But what this illustrates is that, in my opinion, this technology, this integrated system of an embodied computational system is expressing our theory on mind and brain. So the machine is our theory. This is what we're trying to, to achieve. This is the method we work by. So, but that, um, if the machine is our theory, so if you want, this is also my, my belief about how theories of mind and brain will advance. It, they will not advance in the way we advance theory in, in physics, which is much more mathematical. I don't think it's going to work in this domain because we look at very open, highly nonlinear systems. We don't have any mathematics for that. Okay. So, um, this is what we're doing. This is how we try to bring mind and brain together. And the point I'm trying to make is that for us to advance technology, it's also this approach we should all be following. So this is the argument I'm, I'm going I'm to discuss with you. And I would like to place this a bit in contrast to current approaches towards how we can advance technology in the domain that we're discussing, like internet-related technologies. Okay, on the one hand, we could think about these kinds of predictions, right? This is on Time magazine. The prediction by, by Ray Kurzweil and others. Ray Kurzweil, now the chief engineer of Google, which should all make us worry as far as I'm concerned, that by 2045 we will have the so called singularity. That means machines will become smarter than humans, and then humans have to decide whether we join the machines and, in some sense, become their subservience or uh, we're going to fight against them. So, this prediction of the singularity is based on a number of, of assumptions. And this assumption is, for instance, that there is something like Moore's law at work, right? That we have this exponential increase in co computational technology. Um, in addition, there's this claim that we actually know how the brain works. I think both these assumptions are just too strong, they're not very realistic. Being active in the field of neuroscience, I know that the collection of neuroscientists in this world will all admit we have no clue how the brain works. Okay? So it's only people who are fully ignorant of neuroscience who can make these kinds of claims. We just don't know how the brain works. It's a massive open question. Then uh, the, the, the law of accelerating returns in technology is very questionable also because technology is based on certain kinds of hardware. Right? We have uh, rare earth elements we need, we need resources like fossil fuels and so on, which all will be running out during this century, okay? About mid-century, the, 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 the peak of oil production will be reached, and after that will just go down, and the same thing holds for rare earth uh, metals or elements. So the point is to just claim that there is this, this continuous increase of, of computing technology is based on an assumption that we know is incorrect. Right? You can go back to the report of the Club of Rome of the early 60s. We will not have the resources to build this kind of technology anymore. So the technology we have today, this kind of stuff, will stop to exist about mid-century, plus or minus a few decades. But still, we're facing the same problem. So the point is, these kinds of claims are, I think, very tendentious. They are hyping a certain belief in technology, but 
they are actually recapitulating what you already knew from the science fiction movies of the 1980s. Right? Yes, the scenario the technology might take over is actually an easy one. Okay? But the real question is, um, how could this actually be achieved? How could we make a technology that has these kinds of capabilities? And then, of course, this associated question is under what conditions should we be doing that? So the point is, in my opinion, the singularity religion is expressing a very contentious claim about the future with technology that's not really grounded in any reasonable assumptions. It's not going to happen in this way. Our relation with technology will not evolve along these lines. It will go in a very different way because one, we don't understand how the brain works, so we don't have the design principles in our hands right now to build this technology. And secondly, the hardware elements we use to build the technology of today will stop to exist or stop to be available mid-century in all likelihood. Um, a second element we should criticize, so for me the singularity beliefs is techno-religion. Okay? It's not really the way forward and it is also advocated by people who actually have no clue about what they're talking about. Ray Kurzweil has no idea about the brain. Okay? Secondly, uh, another big driver of discussion in this field, which for me is another source of noise, is what's called big data. It's like, oh, we're in this big data field and big data is the new oil and blah, blah, okay? So, indeed, you're all familiar with this, like, our ability to generate data is by far outpacing our ability to make sense of it. Yes, we know that, okay? And there is this belief that there's a lot of richness in this, either economic richness or intellectual richness. Um, but. I think that this data deluge is not necessarily uh, helping us. If you look at this from the perspective of science, right? From a scientific perspective, the data deluge is not helping us. And I will, I will tell you why. So we have, in the domain of neuroscience, there are two big initiatives underway, one in Europe, the Human Brain Project, one in the States, the Brain Initiative, that follow roughly this trajectory of, of big data. And they, they're, they're saying, look, we should do some bottom-up modeling here in Europe. It basically means we collect all the data about the brain and we put it in a big simulator and then suddenly we will understand how the brain works. Okay? That's the claim. Uh, the Brain Initiative in the States is saying, well, we should build new technologies to get this kind of data. But no one ever made the argument that the data we have today is insufficient. Okay, and actually, it's very, it's very doubtful that we don't, we don't have enough data. The problem we're going to end up with will take this shape. Now, this, what does this look like? Star Trek, right? Okay, do, do you know what this is? Okay, no. This is the, the, the NSA's data domination room. It was really built um, by the American Secret Service, by their commander, because he is a Trekkie to start with, but he believes he needs to dominate data, right? That in the end we just pipe all the data they collect about all potential terrorists in the world into this room and he's going to sit there. Okay, he's going to take it all in and then he knows what to do, yeah? So this also very much exemplifies this infatuation with data and how misguided it is, right? It's not about data. As such, in data, there's no information. There's no pure data. It's not that the pure data that you pipe into this room will suddenly tell you who is good and who is bad, right? So what is lacking here, um, of course, they will then send in Team America. If you haven't seen the movie Team America, you should. It's fantastic. Um, so so the, the problem is that, for me, the big data, the big data approach is exemplifying in some sense, a dehumanization, if you want, it is like a, a complete rectification of everything we have achieved during the Renaissance, okay? Because what we're doing in big data is we throw away the human mind. We throw away the inquisitive powers of the human mind and say, no, no, it's, it's in the data and the machines will sort it out, okay? This is a very dangerous development because we're dehumanizing the attempts to understand our universe. 
And it's really a, it's a misguided approach, but this, this approach has a historical explanation that I want to share with you. Um, so it's actually one expression of this um, is you can find in the study of mind and brain, which is a bit of domain I have, I have affinity with, I find interesting. So in the late 19th century, when psychology started as a science, the main objective of psychology was to study consciousness, subjective experience. Okay? And they did that based on introspection. You had trained people who could report what they experienced. Okay? And then in the new world, this movement of behaviorism emerged in the early 20th century that said, well, this is not scientific. Because to be scientific, we must be like physics. We must be able to control our observations. And we actually don't even have to make assumptions about hidden states of systems. We can operationally define them. We can define phenomena through our methods of measurement. So forget all these constructs like will and consciousness. It's useless. It's not scientific. And they insisted on method, obser observable methods. Because as you know, science as such, empirical science is defined as describing reality in third person verifiable terms. I can make a measurement and I can tell you the procedure that I followed and you can make the same observation. Right? So it's third person verifiable. And that's what the behaviorist wanted. They said, well, these subjective states are not third person verifiable. It's not science. But now behaviorism didn't deliver because they promised a universal science of adaptive behavior didn't work out. It, they failed. Okay? And then actually there were two follow-ups. So here was actually the Second World War, which had something to do with this as well, but uh, let's not get there. The point was after the Second World War, we had technology. We had control principles that were elaborated in cybernetics. We had computational principles that were expressed in computers. And these now filled this void that was created by behaviorism. Because suddenly they said, hey, but we might have a very well-defined way to think about internal states of a mind, of a reasoning mind, of, because we have logic machines. And isn't the mind just like logic? Okay, so then the method was killed, the attempt for method was killed, and it all became intelligence and the study of a disembodied mind. Now this also failed. This didn't work out. We had the symbol grounding problem and the frame problem. It just didn't work out. Turned out the mind is, for instance, embodied. The mind doesn't always follow logic and so on. Okay, so with that, we had no more methods, but also now this systematic rationalist logic-based approach has failed. And then we fell into, if you want, a strange intermediate period where biological metaphors were ruling our study of mind. Let's talk about artificial life. It wasn't even close to life. It was not a model of life. It was a very metaphorical interpretation of what life could be. A genetic algorithm has nothing to do with genetics. It's constrained random search. Well, that's not what genes are doing. Okay, the data is out there. The, the, the biological, biological literature that describes this is out there. You just ignore it. If you ignore it, then you can say, well, it, it's a great way to think about optimization. Okay, so we fell into this trap of of a metaphorical biology, which also has failed. It hasn't given us anything. What is left over of behavior-based robotics? Where are the impacts? Where are the impacts of genetic algorithms and A-Life? Nowhere. There's been a massive failure. Okay, it opened the door to a, a bit more affinity to biology. But where are we now? Now we are big data. So you see what happened. We sacrificed the fundamental phenomena we were interested in, which is subjective experience, we sacrificed our methods, right, in psychology. We sacrificed concepts because we based a science on metaphor. So all we got left now is to say, okay, let's then just get the data. Maybe the data will tell us. And I think that's a massive mistake. We have to get back to the fundamental questions of what's the origin. That was the, the third question the undertale was wondering about. What's the origin of consciousness? Right? Why do I experience? And what I'm saying is, in answering that question, we will also advance our technology. So, and that's the message that I'm going to share with you. So, 
it has challenged, big data challenged our model of, of knowledge creation by killing the idea of pursuing hypotheses and saying, oh, forget the hypothesis, just get the data. Okay? But it doesn't give us an alternative. And I'm saying it's a very nihilistic view. It's an anti-Renaissance view of humans dealing with reality because we have kicked out the human mind. And that's what it was all about. It was the human mind in inquisiting, posing questions about reality. We've got to get back to that. So our last problem with technology is this one. I don't know if you remember what happened the first time the front end of the Airbus 380 was brought together with the back end of the 380. One being produced in France, the other one being produced in Germany. Do you remember what went wrong? The cables were miswired. The thing couldn't be put together. So everything had to be taken apart again and rewired. Right? And it's not because these people are stupid. Well, sometimes someone down the line was stupid, but it also shows us something very fundamental about our technology. Right? That it actually doesn't really scale. This is at the level of complexity humans can handle, human engineers can handle. But you see the problems. If we don't have very tight quality control, which is really difficult, we don't get the wires together. So that this will be, let's say, a boundary on what we can achieve with human engineering, right? So that's not going to scale. We face a massive scaling problem. Our technology is a collection of modules. If we want to have a new function, we have to stack a new module into that. And the wiring problem, the scaling problem will get exponentially more complicated. We are at the limits of what we can do there. This is not going to work. So we face a massive scaling and we also face a massive sustainability problem as a result. So um, anyway, so these are some challenges we're facing in the domain of technology. Um, what's our alternative? Okay. So in that sense also with technology that you see a bit these sort of religious Hypey, it's all awesome attitudes towards our technology, like internet. Or when you read stuff on this festival, like, oh, internet's fantastic, it's the future. No, it just, it's a tool we have, it's a means to an end. What's this end we want to achieve? If this end is big data, it's intellectual suicide. Is that what we want? Okay. And then you have all these sort of very metaphorical, like, bits are like atoms. It's, it's nonsense. At best, they're electrons if you want, but it, it doesn't mean anything. It's just very poetic and it sounds really inspiring, but it doesn't help us in any way. This is not the way forward, okay? So let's get back to our original challenge uh, that we tried to address and let's see what we have done with that. So this was a piece called uh, Rapper Curso that we developed together with my friend uh, Jonathan Manzoli, a composer from, from Brazil. And what we're trying to achieve here is we try to understand, okay, how can I make a synthetic agent that has capability of expression? Right? So we try to think about a technology that's not necessarily useful, like it's, it filters your email. We were thinking about a technology that can be expressive, that can let's say, be a partner of, of a human in a creative process. So as you saw in Robert Crusoe, which we performed about four years ago uh, in different locations. In Robert Crusoe, the idea was that we have two human performers, a percussionist and a dancer, and we have six artificial agents. You saw the, the, the avatar, for instance, but we also had robot-controlled cameras in a virtual world, uh, an interactive composition engine, and so on. What should be the rules of control of these synthetic agents so that they can perform together with humans? And so for that, uh, you have to construct a relatively complex 
infrastructure, right? Because you have to think about instrumenting your whole uh, theater, at least the podium, to support real-time interaction with, between these humans and the synthetic agents. Okay, so basically what happens is that you are starting to turn your podium into like an, a robot that's turned inside out. And we did, we performed this experiment to just start to get a handle on the question, okay, how do I make such a synthetic agent creative? And what does it mean to be creative in that sense? What's, what are the rules of creativity that we might find in physical structure? Um, so, and what we, when we built Rapper Crusoe, the question was always in the other, okay, how do brains do this? Okay, what are the processes in brains? Is it like a separate module? Is it some magical module somewhere in the brain? Is it something very intrinsic in brains? What is the origin of creativity? So we have been performing these experiments with different kinds of creative technologies since the late 90s. And the brain in itself is a complex network. So this is a representation of the human connectome, uh, which is a description of, let's say, the functional organization of, of the human brain. In this case, focusing on the cortex, which is the outer shell, it's about as big as a pizza. Okay, a millimeter thick, and it's all stuffed inside your skull. This is based on the Heckman database where they identified nine, about 900 nodes that are central in the dynamics of this, of this brain, of, of the human cortex at rest. And every line indicates how they correlate, how they are functionally connected to each other. Um, but what's special about the brain, and if you think about uh, its contrast to other uh, phenomena we study is its multi-scale organization, right? On the one hand, brains are strongly dependent on molecular structure. Our memory, the stable part of memory, is, is a molecule, chemkinase 2, that sort of sits within cells, they form a ring, and if this ring is stable, it's a stable signal for memory. So memory depends on the molecular organization of intercellular processes. Okay. On the other hand, our brain is immersed in culture, in social groups, and they themselves, these social groups and their regularities also influence how a brain organizes itself. So what's so unique about brains is this multi-scale organization. Um, and that also makes it so difficult for us to apply models from the physical sciences to it. Because you don't have this multi-scale organization of the system to deal with. That makes the challenge so great. Um, but the brain is as such a biological system. And if we declare it biological, it means we have to think about this in evolutionary terms. Right? The brain is the product of evolution. That means um, if you look here at the evolution of life forms on Earth over the last two billion years, we have this, this moment of the Cambrian explosion in which actually all body plans that we know, the 30 body plans we know of all extant animals uh, and their brains emerged, um, which, which also means evolution has optimized fitness, which in the end is expressed as differential reproduction. Um, over this, these three billion years of evolution, it has conserved the principles at which life is based. So this is also why we first share 50% of our genome with um, single cellular organisms, okay? Um, we share 99% with chimpanzees. You're familiar with these numbers. But what this expresses is that there are principles conserved in the designs of life forms. But this also holds um, a wonderful book on that is The Plausibility of Life, actually. This also holds for, for brains. But now if we look in detail, let's see, this thing is, is supposed to move, but it doesn't move. Okay, so here we see how a single cell, how a single cell, so the point I'm going to make, if we deal with fundamental properties of our cells, of brains, like as for instance in terms of creativity, um, you already find forms of creativity in single cells. Like here you see a single cell um, that is putting out these processes, okay, by 
building microtubules, so these are very small tubes that it puts out dynamically, okay? And these microtubules, um, these microtubules are being put out from the nucleus and they take on different shapes and extend dependent on the signals they receive from the environment. So in this sense, the cell, the single cell, is exploring the state space in which it is embedded. And for me, this is already the rudimentary example of creativity. So what I want to show with that is that if we think about these very fundamental properties of brains and also of our own existence as creativity, which you might consider uniquely human, in my opinion, you will find rudimentary, the, the, the origins of this already in single cellular life. Just to illustrate again this idea of conserving principles. So if you now go to, let's say, this mouse, here we have a mouse, you put this mouse in an open field, what you will see is that this mouse also has to explore a state space now. And it will explore this state space in a very specific way. It will not do this randomly. Okay, for instance, it will just go around in this state space and it will uh, find a corner that it will call home. Why would it call it home? Because it goes back to that corner a lot. And then from that corner, it will start to explore its environment. Okay, so the perspective we're taking on this is that fundamental properties of brains are based on these conserved principles of life, going back to single cells. But the state space exploration you will find here in this mouse shares many properties with the state space exploration you'll find in the single cell. So it's about the conservation of principles. Um, so the oldest musical instruments that humans or our predecessors have, have made are about 35,000 years old. In this case, exploring a state space of stimulation. Sonic stimulation in this case, because they made, they made these, these flutes from the bones of these vultures. Um, so this is, oops, what's going on? All my videos have collapsed, it looks like. Well, I'm sorry for that. Okay, so what we did four years ago, we built what's called a the brain orchestra, okay, well, I want to show you the brain orchestra, so let's, let's go find that because this is, this is something you have to see. Um,
Hello. Okay, that's better. All right, so what we did in the Brain Orchestra is that this is the world's first chamber orchestra that is playing its musical instruments with brain-computer interfaces. Um, so their brain activity was interfaced to an interactive real-time music composition system that took these signals to then generate a multi-track composition. But you also saw the movie here playing in the background and this was used as a stimulus to our what we call emotional conductor. So we were changing the emotional state of this person. And we're reading out her state using physi physiological measures like heart rate and electrodermal response. And that set the emotional connotation of the composition. All right. So, um, so what we were trying to do with, deal with here is, okay, how can I use direct brain signals to to generate an interactive composition. And an important thing that, that we've learned in performing these experiments is on the one hand, the embodied nature of that creative process, as I showed you earlier in our uh, single cell example, it's situatedness, like in this case, the emotional connotation of the composition results from the emotional state of our um, of our emotional conductor, and that also makes it very, let's say, it deviates from the standard view on creativity in our Western tradition, where we think about it as originating by some ingenious composer, right, who, who, who annotates his ideas about, let's say, a musical piece or a piece of literature, what have you, that then is performed by other humans as automata, okay? But you can also see that creativity as such and also as it is expressed in living forms, is a situated process intrinsic to life forms as I showed you earlier. So the experiments I described to you, uh, the experiments I described to you are going back to a theory that uh, I built on mind and brain because this was our original challenge as I, as I told you. Um, and I want to show, and we have been putting a lot of effort in mapping that theory to specific structures in the brain, which we're, which we're not going to talk about in detail. Okay? But what I want to show to you is how in testing this theory, the machines we built have been central, have been key, and also what we've learned of doing that. And also I want to show you now a design methodology of actually building applications in close coupling, in close linkage to the basic science. Um, a key theme, you earlier saw the rat exploring, the mouse exploring its environment. A key theme we have been advancing in this, the embodiment of the creative process, also the embodiment of knowledge and the embodiment of memory. We have taken that basic observation, um, we've built details, brain models of this. And what we learn from these brain models is that action as such shapes memory very strongly. So that insight we have taken to different applications. Like here's one of them. This is the ADA exhibition that we built uh, about in 2002 in Switzerland. It was like a robot turned inside out, a space that was interacting with its visitors as an organism based on the theory I sketched to you earlier. But what we observed in the experiments with this space, where we looked at how do people interact with such an environment, what do they learn from such an environment, what do they remember from interacting with this biologically grounded technology? Well, what we saw here is that if you look at the questionnaires we gave, when we had over half a million people visiting, and afterwards, we asked them about their understanding of the, the causal relationship that they had with this environment. And we divided people in whether they were active in terms of walking around in the space and really interacting with it actively or standing in the corner and observing. And we already noticed that active engagement with the technology made a huge difference. So here you indicate we, in green significant differences 
on their understanding of certain aspects of this environment. Okay? So this is our first observation that active engagement with the world leads to better understanding. So we have then elaborated on that. So here you see an example of a rehabilitation technology we have developed based on that observation. It's called the rehabilitation gaming system. So now we knew that active engagement, embodied engagement with the world matters. So then we thought, okay, we should now exp capitalize on this insight. Who, who can we help in society with that? So we went for stroke patients. We combined this insight of active embodied engagement <coughs> with the theory of mind and brain we had developed to develop a rehabilitation protocol. And it's called the rehabilitation gaming system. Right now we are commercializing this because we have treated over 400 people, also 50 at home, with extremely good results on both acute and chronic stroke patients. And we know now this is the best thing you can get compared to anything else that's available. And that's why it must be made available, okay? Um, so it's faster and to a higher level of functionality because actually we are facing a health crisis in our society that most people with chronic stroke, and you know a stroke basically means there's a hole in your brain, get a few months of treatment and rehabilitation and then they're sent home and they're told, sorry, there's nothing we can do for you anymore. This is not true, okay? There's a lot we can do for these people. It's just too expensive. We don't have the, the infrastructure, the logistics, and so on. The insurance companies don't cover it. Using technology, we can have an impact here. The, the world population of chronic stroke patients is 60 million. And right now, nothing is being done for them. And, and this, is, this is really a disgrace, okay? Here, we can have an impact with technology. So this is why we're commercializing this. Another thing we're doing, um, well, let's jump to this one. We went to the Bergen Belsen Memorial site where we applied this insight about the, the active structuring of memory in how we deal with the collective memory of our society, as for instance in the Holocaust. Holocaust memory is disappearing. If our collective memory of our past in Europe is disappearing, we also have no understanding anymore about our future. We must conserve this history. So what we built is a tablet-based uh, application combined with a virtual reality uh, environment where we now reconstruct the historical site. So because many of these sites in Europe right now are just taken over by nature or by urban development. So there are no artifacts anymore that remind us of this history. But what we do, so this is the museum of the bergen belsen Memorial. These classes of school kids now use this tablet to go back on the site. And if you want to forage for information. But now you understand why we give it this shape, because we know activity modulates memory. So we want these school kids to actively explore the information space. And we are grounding the information. We use space, if you want, as a portal to information. But also you see here, it's not just about providing abstract information. We must exploit the embodiment of the agent that gathers this information. Like this is what it looks like, right? There's nothing there that tells you anything about the history. Right? But we have taken this approach now to advance a technology that helps us again to understand at least aspects of our collective history, which these kids has been extremely effective. We use the same technology as well to interview uh, survivors, which also has been, or, or witnesses of, of Holocaust and Nazi crimes, which is also has been extremely effective. So I'm trying to illustrate again that we can rationalize the way we build technology and we can have impact with it and we can do things that are actually relevant to our society. Um, so this is roughly what people see when they use a tablet. Okay, so you see the reconstruction and we use this reconstruction for people to access historical sources that help them to understand what happened in this, in this landscape. Um, so these examples, so I gave you a bit some criticism of technology. I tried to show you how we are going beyond that, trying to base technology on the science of mind and brain, but that the machines we built are our theory. And then I gave you some examples how we have extrapolated that towards 
applications that I think are relevant for the kinds of problems we're facing in our society. So I would like to summarize with that. So actually this whole idea of using machines as a means of understanding goes back to John Battista Vico, you might all be familiar with, right? Who, who saw that the artifacts we construct, the fact and the truth are reversible. He was in a deep debate with Descartes on how do we, how do we ground our knowledge of the universe. And for Vico, it was not in a reductionist scheme. For Vico it was, we find knowledge in the things we build. And that's exactly what we're doing. I think it's an alternative model of knowledge generation than going back to Vico. And actually, if you think about the big discoveries in the life sciences, like the structure of DNA, was discovered exactly in that way. Watson and Crick explained the X-ray diffraction data of Rosalind Franklin by building physical models of DNA. It was not a bunch of equations, right? Also there, the machine was the theory, if you want. The artifact was the theory. And we're just advancing this now also towards the study of the brain. And that means our relationship, the relation between basic science and applied science is changing. Like the standard view is to say, well, basic science is in one corner of the room and applied science in the other corner. And the objectives are very different. Or at best, they're unidirectional. And I think that's a big mistake. We can couple these, domain, these domains much more as I've tried to show you. Right? It's the machines we built in the basic science that directly translate into application. But now the application is testing theories. The application is like an experiment that you perform. And this is the relationship we must build. If we advance basic science in isolation of this kind of deductive testing and application, we're making a mistake. But equally, if we advance applications disconnected from basic understanding, we also make a mistake. Then we're just hacking our way towards the future and that's not going to work, right? So what I'm advancing is something called Vico's loop, where the, the basic theory we develop on mind and brain leads to new rehabilitation technologies. But failures of this rehabilitation technology in the clinic is informing that theory. We have a coupling, a synergistic coupling between basic science and application that we can find here. So how do we build such a, f a future? We call this the Living Machines Manifesto. I already sketched to you um, the problems of current technology, but in the meantime we're facing many challenges. Okay, we face challenges in our social environment, think about the, think about the aging population, Educational environments, current educational systems just don't work. It's more uh, part-time imprisonment for young kids. Uh, urban environments are collapsing. The way we deal with environments, think about the Ebola crisis, right? Uh, actually, it's, it's really terrible. Where is our technology to help these people? It's not there. It's really just not there. We, we have failed, okay, at, on a massive scale. And, and these are not trivial challenges. This is what we have to attack. Who cares about writing another app that whatever can, can make you Snapchat with someone, it's, right? It's not about making the money, it's about solving relevant problems. We have failed tremendously. We have to improve, okay? So um, the problem I sketched to you, the answer to get to this point that we might actually build machines, not only robots, but machines, living machines that can really help humanity and advance our cause, not take over like Skynet, um, should be based on this. This is the humble bee. The bee is amazing, right? It can fly, it can learn, navigate, it can remember, it can communicate. And at all of that, with a cubic millimeter brain with about 100,000 units in it, it's highly energy sufficient, it's sustainable. We just don't know how it works. But this is the shape of the technology of the future that we're trying to to define, and actually there's a whole ecology of these solutions, not only bees. All these brains are solving very specific problems. And they share design principles, and these are the design principles we have to get our hands on. So what we are proposing is our research program collectively should be to build embodied conscious systems at all these scales of organization of living systems from bees to humans and beyond that on the one hand advance our understanding of mind and brain and in parallel perform tasks and supporting, play a supporting role to advance the cause of humanity. 
So this is advanced by, uh, so I'll, to close I'll show you an example of how we're doing that. So here we have our humanoid robot again. But we have now linked that up with our, the reconstruction of the human brain. So this is again the best description we have of the human brain right now. It's called the connectome. I showed it to you earlier. We can simulate the connectome in real time. And we've interfaced that connectome to a humanoid robot. Yeah, so technically, we have the capability to link biologically grounded control systems, in this case, even grounded in our understanding of the human brain, to humanoid robots in, in real time. So this is really where we're going. Okay, so here you see how the, the sensory and the motor capabilities of this robot are linked to the sensory and motor areas of this brain. In terms of the neuroscience, it's all vaporware, okay? The, the neuroscience has to be advanced here a lot. There's a lot of stuff missing. But you see it's possible. It's even possible at the level of, of the human brain and human behavior, okay? And so it's not just a story I'm telling you, like, oh, wouldn't it be amazing to ground our technology in biology? No, we can do it. We ha the technical capabilities to do this are there, okay? It's not just vaporware. But it's also the, the fundamental questions now are, but what are the organizational principles of that system? And how do we capitalize on that? How do we build a future with this technology? So this is what we call our uh, living machines manifesto, where we say, if we acknowledge the fundamental challenges of technology, the only way to find a sustainable solution is by looking at biology. This is what we have to do. And we have to find sustainable solutions to problems that matter. Not about making one euro more or less, irrelevant, okay? Humanity is facing fundamental questions. Just think about West Africa, what's happening there right now. It's, it's really terrible, okay? We must, we must build technologies that actually matter, okay? And we can do that. So for the Convergence Science Network, it's a coordination action that I'm coordinating with a number of my colleagues in Europe. We try to advance this Living Machine Manifesto. So please join our initiative. You can go to our website and sign up. We have an annual conference. This year was in the Leonardo da Vinci Museum in Milano. Next year will be in Barcelona. So you can share your work and your contributions to the construction of living machines. So please join us there. Um, so my conclusions, for me, consciousness is our challenge in a broad sense. Consciousness in the end means massive integration. You cannot say a thing about consciousness if you don't know something about emotion or about perception or about cognition. That's why consciousness is our goal, because it's integrative at the system level. Then technology is not religion, it's about getting stuff done. And it's a catalyst for change, but we have to choose our objectives carefully and with taste. We want to solve problems that matter, as we have failed to do, largely. Um, I showed you some examples where I tried to make the key point of saying the machine is a theory. It's a different way of thinking about knowledge and the advancement of knowledge. And that leads to a synergistic relationship between application and basic science. The application is testing theories, okay? If applications don't work, something's wrong with the theory. This is what we have to seek. If we keep on advancing basic science and application in isolation, we're gonna be stuck as we are now. Okay, we have, to, we have to couple this together, and that's what we can do when we shift towards this notion of living machines. Building technology on an understanding of biology. This is where we have to go, because this is the only way to find sustainability and robustness in the face of the real world. And as I told you, by mid-century, we will have no more electronics anyway. We have to take, go for the big challenge, not run away for the small ones. Um, so this is then summarized what we call the Living Machines Manifesto. Um, I hope you join us, so go to csnetwork.eu, uh, sign up, and I hope to see you at one of our conferences. Thank you very much.